every night, trains around the world carry people to the places where they belong. We at First Alpina Railway Systems understand the needs of global mobility. We maximize safety, improve efficiency, and take availability to a new level. Because we believe in railway transportation, the most sustainable mobility system to face urbanization and increasing levels of freight traffic. As the only global provider of complete track system solutions, we offer the most extensive and integrated track portfolio, rails, turnouts, signaling solutions and services. We build our success on 160 years of experience and with a continuous drive for improvement and innovation. The source of our success is us, the team of First Alpina Railway Systems. We are researchers seeking for advanced materials and geometries. We are workers creating rails and turnouts with state-of-the-art production systems. We are developers of smart solutions for the railway infrastructure of tomorrow. It is all of us who deliver track components just in time to any location. And it's us who offer a comprehensive service portfolio along the whole life cycle of our products. We develop the most innovative solutions with a focus on the organization of life cycle costs to keep our promise. We are more than 7,000 colleagues working at 70 locations on five continents, combining our knowledge, experience, and talents for the benefit of our customers. This is our contribution to modern mobility and a green planet worth living for future generations. This is us, the team of First Alpina Railway Systems. And together, we ensure performance on track. First Alpina, one step ahead. Good afternoon and welcome everybody at this joint webinar of Railtech and First Alpina Signaling. Um, where we'll talk about monitoring in real and how to make the most of the data that's collected. Uh, in the studio with me are Richard Lenthal, Vice, Vice President of Customer Management at Visalpina Signaling, and Markus Urban, Product Manager. Um, welcome to you both. Good Thank afternoon. you. Hello. Um, and joining us online uh, is Niels Kloppenburg, Lead Manager of DSB. Welcome. And uh, later on, we will have a, a Q&A with you because you're... Um, yeah, one of the customers and, and railways that are using the, the CMS system of Visalpina. Um, so uh, we'll tune in uh, later with you again. Um, for the people at home, you can uh, at any point ask your questions to any of the speakers uh, in the chat. And uh, yeah, if you want to, you can also share uh, where you're tuning in from. Um, that would be nice to know. Um, and the webinar will be recorded as well and available as a playback. Um, to watch uh, later or, or share with your colleagues. Um, Richard, welcome again. Hello. Um, yeah, we're talking today about uh, monitoring and then how to make the most of that data. Um, so first, I think we have a, a video kind of to show um, yeah, what, what Visalpin is doing uh, with the monitoring checkpoints, and then we'll later on talk about yeah, how, how to make sense of, of what is collected there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you tuned in, if your viewers tuned in uh, two weeks ago when I introduced the Intelligent Rail Summit with a webinar, um, you would have noticed the video um, that uh, introduced all of the monitoring functions that First Alpina can provide to our customers. So on the screen in, in front of you now, you see once again the profile validation system, which uh, detects objects that are uh, sort of outside of the gauge, so to speak, and that alerts the customers. Immediately, then uh, again, the video moves on to the acoustic uh, monitoring sensor that we've got. Uh, also, will be part of the uh, visit, technical visit at the Intelligent Rail Summit, as well. Um, it moves then on to the uh, wheel defect detection and way in motion system, which will be part of my uh, my, my introductory speech shortly, uh, and that uh, reports information to do with the health of the wheel set back to the back to the customers. You've got the hot box and hot wheel detection system. 
uh, that we have over 2,000 uh, units of installed around the world right now. And uh, um, the train uh, then moves on to our new system, which is the visual train analysis um, uh, system, which detects uh, and records uh, various pieces of information varying from the uh, brake block detection and, and uh, thickness to simple things like the train number itself. Um, all of those uh, different types of system then report their data, uh, as we know, back to the trackside cabinet. Um, and uh, from the trackside cabinet, that then goes into our what we call the Phoenix CMS, Central uh, Management System software. And um, what, that is part of the conversation that I'd like to have uh, this afternoon with, uh, with the guests. Yeah, yeah. So today it's all going to be about what to do and what happens after uh, all those different systems collect information about about trains that are running and, and passing. Indeed. Um, uh, and I believe you have a, a case study that you want to share that kind of is a good example of how uh, and how, what the different uses are of, of that data. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what I'd like to talk to uh, with the guests this afternoon um, is the uh, uh, installations that we have uh, installed on HS1 in the UK on behalf of Network Rail High Speed. Uh, we have um, a number of two of our wheel defect and weigh in motion systems installed on that network. We have one just north of the Thames at Wennington and one just outside Ashford um, uh, at Chris Mills. And these systems report and detect the health of the uh, wheel set in terms of the wheels, any flat spots, um, diagonal imbalance, uh, and that information gets put into the Phoenix CMS. And then what we have on HS1 through consultancy and uh, talking to the stakeholders of that track is we manipulate the data in a certain way depending on the needs of that particular customer. So you see on the screen now that we send stop alarms when the train has a defect which is higher than 400 kilonewtons and that then uh, is signaled to the network rail uh, to allow the train to be stopped in good time before uh, the uh, train uh, is derailed because the defect uh, is too much. And you can see on the screen in front of you now how the alarm in the latest version of Phoenix CMS, the alarming and intervention application, looks. So you can see that we can provide different, uh, different types of pictographs and uh, alarms to the customer. If you're one of the train operating companies that runs trains over that network, such as Eurostar and Hitachi, we provide alerts to prevent the alarm in a way and provide information to the customer's uh, the train operating customers to say, okay, you've got a growing defect on that wheel, it's time that you should get to it and schedule that train for maintenance. So we've got a kind of whole data ecosystem, if you like, on that, uh, on that particular uh, network. And what you'll see shortly is uh, the uh, current version of the um, uh, fleet condition monitoring application where that uh, information is sliced and diced, if you like, and that will also be part of what Marcus is going to talk about shortly. What we also have uh, contributed, again, from taking the data from way in motion systems, is we've contributed to a data program from Dutch Railways, which allows customers to um, stand at the correct part of the platform so that they can um, gain, uh, get on the train as quickly as possible. Uh, and so they know where to stand and boarding and uh, entering the train is, uh, is efficient. Yeah, and that's on the previous slide, I believe. Uh, yeah, uh, and what you see here is uh, a, 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 a checkpoint at Oberreich in uh, Austria. And as we'd seen in the video earlier, what you can see is all of the data uh, that is collected from our modular systems, be that um, uh, uh, dragging equipment detection, um, profile validation, hotbox, flat wheel, all that goes into Phoenix CMS where we work with the customer to understand how they would want that data to be uh, presented uh, to their uh, employees. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So the system then collects, uh, yeah, uh, all those data at a, at a monitoring system like this. And I believe in, in Austria that's quite uh, far with, with these checkpoints. Is it, for example, then at the HS1 uh, the same, that there are so many systems? or? Yeah, the, the, the beauty of MDS and CMS is that it's completely scalable and flexible. So um, what you see on HS1 is just a, 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 a two installations of wheel defect detection and wear motion. And the trains that are passing over those two sites run at 300 kilometers an hour. Um, both of the customers that we've got run high-speed trains, and there's also freight trains that go over that network. And they're very happy with the um, way in which the data is um, pre presented to them. If you look at what we've managed to do in uh, Austria for UBB, there's uh, 42 checkpoints that are going in. And what the, the scalability of the solution is such that it allows us to put in different types of monitoring function 
inside one cabinet, just inside one installation. And all of that is standardized in its data presentation to the customer. And they can then take the best decisions uh, on, on what is to them recognizable uh, and actionable data. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and uh, Marcus, you will uh, talk about uh, some, in, in some more detail about uh, the CMS system. Yes, <clears throat> I will explain a little bit how it works. And um, for this, I brought some slide with me. as little introduction. And you see here um, what Richard was talking about is exactly the icons uh, that are in the lower level. So this means these icons in a lower level represent every sensor that is measuring in the track. And um, above this um, silver thing is our Phoenix CMS. And you see we have different, different applications for different users. And um, above you will see a lot of interfaces we already refer to our customers. It depends a little bit of the need of the customer and uh, what kind of uh, interest is um, in his focus. Huh? So we have infrastructure managers, for example, that are using the system more in direction alarming intervention yeah, to prevent something. And you see um, system supervision, for example, is something that is very interesting for people uh, that want to know, is my system up and running? So in, in, in our language, we uh, say checkpoint. Yeah? Um, this means a checkpoint is an amount of different sensors that is combined in, in one location and is measuring with different functions, like we are measuring uh, temperatures of the bearings or we are measuring uh, forces on the wheels. Um, this is uh, what we call a checkpoint. And every sensor that is coming uh, in the system is uh, then reported to our Phoenix CMS. Yeah? And this is the train measurements that we use in our Phoenix CMS for exactly to provide data to our customer roles like system maintainer, traffic controller. And um, for this purpose, you see uh, alarming intervention. Richard mentioned it. Um, if there is coming at network rail an alarm, it's going directly to network rail. And um, I will show uh, in the next uh, video we will see um, how it works a little bit in detail and uh, then we will go a little bit through it and see how what we can do with the data that we are using right for um, alarm cases um, how we can uh, transform them into valuable data that is interesting for other people in the company like fleet managers or uh, like rolling stock managers and so on Okay, um, maybe we can go to the next slide. There I will explain it a little bit more in detail. You asked um, what we have we seen. Um, we have seen um, the HS1 case. Yeah, we, uh, Richard said there are two checkpoints, three checkpoints, something around this. But you see probably it could be more than uh, uh, one checkpoint. You see here, this is uh, from a well-known customer and, and and card uh, where you see his checkpoints and every of this icon is representing one to uh, x sensors. Yeah? So this doesn't mean that there is one function. Uh, and checkpoint is always in summary of uh, measuring functions. Yeah? And um, yeah. Yeah, and then the green ones <coughs> that are then the checkpoints that are working correctly? Yes, you are absolutely right. The green ones is for sure the thing that is uh, making me happy because Every sensor is working correctly, and uh, uh, green is uh, a good color. Yeah, so we are working with uh, the normal colors: green, yellow, red. And you see, there is not a lot of red in this case. So every red checkpoint is uh, interesting for the people that are for system supervision. So uh, probably people that are interested in supervision would now check why are these checkpoints um, not working correctly and would uh, maintain the checkpoints or maybe the sensors are damaged, are exchanged or something else like this. Okay, um, I would like to show how it works in alarming intervention when an uh, alarm comes in and a dispatcher is showing what is happening. So Esther, could you please provide me the next video? Yes. You see here a dispatcher 
and uh, the dispatcher is looking in his notifications tab. In the notifications, it's empty. That's good for him. It's his job. He's checking now if the systems are working correctly that he is responsible for. So he's checking the checkpoint. He sees ah, the, the measurement from the checkpoint, for example, is coming up. And now is happening something right above in the corner. You will see it's changing through the red color. And uh, it's indicating we have now here an alarm coming in. Absolute hot right bearing. So the dispatcher has to react. He goes back to his notifications. He can do it directly by clicking on the alarm. But um, in this case, he is referring to notifications. He is checking what kind of alarm. He's looking on which axle is the alarm, what is the position, and he gets a recommendation what he could do about the alarm. He says, acknowledge. So I saw the alarm, I got the alarm, and I'm doing something about the alarm. In this case, he's checking, is it the right number? This is OK. And he's entering a remark. He's a little bit nervous because of um, he's a new dispatcher, so he's forgetting the O in this case. Um, but it doesn't matter. He makes a good job. He prevented uh, maybe some, uh, yeah, some urgent thing happening afterwards because he stopped the train. And uh, this is a little bit what he's doing, alarming intervention. So the alarm will vanish now. And this is his kind of job. So he has an, an, an alarming window in the application. And in this uh, alarming window, he will get all the information that is in his interest. He's normally responsible for a part of the track. And uh, so his focus is more, is everybody uh, traveling secure above my track? Yeah. And uh, an alarm means, um, in this case, alarming intervention, um, it's too late. Yeah? So the alarm is a measurement that is saying uh, the indicators are above our thresholds, and I have to react. And uh, this is exactly what dispatchers all over the world are, are doing. Yeah? They are preventing uh, further damage from infrastructure, from persons, and so on. Um, this was a little bit in the past and is as actual as uh, in the past today as well. Um, but to be honest, uh, we don't want to have these alarms. Huh? Um, this means um, we are talking today, what do we with the data to become more valuable? And um, alarms are coming because uh, the rolling stock that is running over the checkpoints is um, having some trouble because of hot bearings or we have flat wheels or something else like this. So measuring forces, measuring temperatures is uh, something maybe the most of the people know. Um, what Richard, for example, introduced, the AMS, the acoustic monitoring system, is a little bit more in direction, not uh, looking on an alarm, but to what is happening inside the bearing, yeah? so that we can prevent maybe a bearing becoming a hot bearing by uh, looking on acoustic monitoring. And um, the whole thing that we are, we are doing is we grab all this data and we try to find out what is happening on the track. Yeah? Because we all, when we travel, uh, our interest is we want to travel safe and comfortable. Yeah? Nobody wants to sit in a train with a, a hot bearing, really. Yeah? I didn't even know before I started that with Serpina that some people are tracking it. And uh, it's amazing that it is uh, happening directly on the track. But um, comfortable in this way, um, when we sit in a train, um, maybe the one or the other uh, remembers these sounds trains made uh, um, sometimes when there is a flat wheel, yeah? this hammering. You are sitting in the cabin and you want to read a book and it making to do, to do, to do. Yeah? So it's a very sound that is disturbing. Yeah? It's not disturbing only you, it's disturbing also the people that are living next to the track. Yeah? And uh, these are a lot of problems, and we have solutions for this. Yeah? And these solutions is a little bit going into direction speed condition monitoring. And um, so we saw the alarming intervention video. And uh, I come back here to my slide. 
and will explain a little bit. We saw now in system supervision how it is working, um, that the track is up and uh, measuring, the track equipment, sorry. Uh, we saw an alarming intervention. What is happening when a dispatcher is receiving an alarm? It was just an example, so there could be quite a lot of alarms. Yeah, it uh, depends a little bit if you are running uh, on on uh, persons yeah, in, in the train or if you're freight in the train. Um, every customer handles it a little bit uh, on his way. Yeah? It's an, something you conversate about and then you design the checkpoint. And um, where I want to lead over is uh, we want to talk a little bit about the fleet manager and the rolling stock because the data that is coming in, uh, we are not only measuring the alarms, we are measuring the whole train. So we get every value from every axle that is uh, counted, from every um, bearing that is running over the track. And um, with all these data, we have a lot of value in our application because we can do a lot, lot more things. Yeah? We can um, give information to the fleet condition monitoring and in the fleet condition monitoring um, it is working a little bit different from alarming intervention. Um, yeah, so the, the, the goal is to go indeed to, um, to come to a situation where you don't have such an alarm because you already yeah, prevented the damage from getting getting so far and yeah. that, that's what you're doing with the fleet condition monitoring application. Yeah, from our, from our point of view, the goal is to reduce as far as possible the number of alarms that the infrastructure manager will have on his network because nobody wants to have a, a blocked track or an unavailable section of track or, frankly speaking, unavailable rolling stock. The idea of uh, the concept of the fleet condition monitoring application is to provide almost a, a pre-alarm, okay? It's uh, to alert the, the, our customers that there is a growing defect with their rolling stock that they should get to uh, in good time. So that the infrastructure manager doesn't doesn't stop their train in the middle of nowhere, okay? Because when these alarms typically happen, as as we saw in the United Kingdom last week, these trains are not going to be stopped in the middle of a city where it's convenient. They're not going to be stopped with an alarm outside of the depot. These operational challenges and incidents happen in the country when the train is running at full service speed, okay? And on HS1. To go back to that uh, uh, case study just briefly, on HS1 what we did was we got together all of the stakeholders of that railway, the train operating companies, the freight operating companies and the infrastructure manager and we sat them all down and we said look how do you want this to work because they were the experts of their railway. I'm the expert, we're the experts in providing decision support software but how do you want that to work on your railway? And that is the decision, and that is where Mark has covered in the alarming and intervention application section, uh, that the, the messages that we give to our customers are really tailorable and configurable because the message that is provided to the signaler is defined by the operational guidelines of that railway. I can't turn around to customers like Eurostar and define what their alarms be, would be and then pick that up and go, okay, here's SMRT in Singapore these are going to be the same alarm thresholds. No, they, they won't be. So what we need, and what we've heard from our customers, is, is that that type of message delivery needs to be tailorable so that the end result, which is a decision support message, is relevant to that railway's operation. Yeah, so it also can differ how, how it looks and what kind of... Absolutely, it can. Values yes, are, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, just, yeah. you know, we, we, we're, we're in the business of providing a message and a service to our customers that makes sense in the shortest possible time to our to our railways and uh, to our railways customers employees, and the idea is that you take the CMS and you say, okay, this is the person that needs the alarm. This is the person that needs the fleet condition uh, status message. This is the person who's monitoring the monitoring systems, and what do they need to know at that particular time? Because what I've what I've seen since I joined the company is is that there's a lot of discussion about uh, putting together data lakes or big data, okay? And uh, these discussions uh, and, and the result of these discussions is quite often a mass of data 
that sit somewhere on the cloud or in, the, in, in servers. But occasionally, what I then hear is, is that our customers don't have the time or the resource to act upon or decipher the code or to carry out an analysis on the data which is stored on those servers. They've just got it. And what we're trying to do is to say, look, we're trying to give you the opportunity to decipher the data, to work with the data, to take action upon the data so that those customers um, can, can improve the operation and efficiency of their railways. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, we just had a look at how it looks in, in the CMS uh, on the alarming intervention. And uh, I believe you also, Mark, said at a video about, indeed, um, the fl fleet condition monitoring. So yeah. um, <clears throat> that can uh, hopefully be avoided an alarm. Um, so we hopefully. can play the video and then you can... Yeah, please. Uh, you see here fleet condition monitoring. And um, as you can see, we have here an algorithm that is giving us a notification, something's happening, we see a little trend. We drill down now to the boogie frame where exactly it is. And you see here, um, he's looking for one wheel. So he's filtering it and um, looking for exactly the component that is damaged. Then it's loading just the component in the worst state and uh, in this case, um, he can make decisions um, right before the alarm is occurring. Yeah? It was just an, a quick example, and you saw on the screen a lot of um, tabulators. Yeah? So these are the algorithms that I talk about. And uh, algorithms is um, one thing that is used to find out what is happening on the track. Yeah? And uh, there are quite very simple algorithms. Yeah? So if you are interested into a trend, you have not to be an expert um, because it depends a little bit on what kind of rolling stock is on your focus. Yeah? Mm. If you run a metro, for example, and you have an, um, an, an round trip on, on your metro and it's running always over the same system, yeah? we have a customer in Spain, for example, um, that is doing like this and um, he's measuring with our systems the, the motor, the gearbox, the clutches and so on. And um, he had the problem that problems um, come up quite, um, I would say, quick. Yeah? So if a uh, temperature of a motor is increasing, he saw it will increase within uh, two or three rounds. Yeah? And so um, he asked us, what can you do about it? Yeah? And we developed some system with him where we measured then these positions uh, under the vehicle. And um, we made some algorithm for him that is using just a linear regression, so just some very simple mathematical stuff where you uh, evaluate when the uh, vehicle is passing the next time, the checkpoint, how could the temperature, looking to the last measurements, um, be in the future when the vehicle will pass the next time. Yeah? Um, so it is not, uh, not magic, I would say. But it's helping him because in, in the past he had a lot of trouble yeah? when uh, the vehicle was really um, stopped on the track then uh, he had to bring the maintenance vehicle out he had to uh, uh, bring some uh, other vehicle on the track um, people were waiting yeah? they did not come to the to to work uh, they did not come um, to their friends and so on and um, it was a lot of money i would say and time and also stress for the customer that was uh, burned because there was a blocked uh, track. Mm. And this is exactly what uh, is now in a uh, real good condition because you can see now it is increasing. Uh, he can directly react and he has the decision himself. Uh, it's completely independent. Um, just to um, tell a little bit about the difference from system supervision and fleet condition monitoring is, uh, uh, sorry, alarming intervention and fleet condition monitoring. Um, in alarming intervention, you are reacting directly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you are measuring in direction of the train. This means if the dispatcher sees an alarm on the uh, 13th axle on the left side, he will say to the train driver, please go out on the left side of your train to the 13th axle and uh, look if it's really a hot bearing um, and um, give me please some response. Yeah? 
Uh, fleet condition monitoring is uh, doing it in another way. We are not reacting on the alarms. We give with the um, notifications and with the uh, algorithms the possibility to the customer to react earlier. So it is not referring to the measurements of the alarms. It is referring directly to the measurements coming from, from the same vehicle, from the same train measurement. And uh, the interesting thing is in fleet condition monitoring, we rotate the vehicles and assign the components measurements um, directly to the site that has passed. Yeah? We're doing it uh, with tech readers, for example. You see in this uh, little picture here, um, the ID is uh, the symbol for the tech reader. So we can say, uh, is it passing with the left side or the right side over the track? And um, if you um, refer to these uh, um, tech, texts that are read, yeah, you can properly say, how is the vehicle uh, passing my checkpoint? Mm -hmm. And then you are interested about components over time. Mm -hmm. And this is the difference. Because components over time means um, I can track the development of the measurements on every particular component of my vehicle. And um, this is the thing what we are currently doing, this fleet condition monitoring, and uh, giving the opportunity to the rolling stock managers and fleet, con uh, fleet managers to maintain the vehicles before an alarm occurs. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, but this is not the only thing we are doing. Um, what we are also doing in this case is um, we are looking for the values uh, with algorithms uh, from machine learning, for example. Yeah? Because if you measure some kind of incident or if you have an, an force, it is not necessary um, something happening um, that is uh, directly having influence on your daily business. Yeah? Uh, but in force can be an indicator for what is happening on this component. Uh, and component, for example, in wheel, if you measure force, uh, 400 kilonewton, you do not know what happened on the wheel. And this is a question that we wanted to answer. And because of this, um, we go with machine learning in this direction that we um, are talking with our customers together. Mm. Uh, we will later um, have some customer uh, with us, Niels Kloppenburg, where we exactly are doing this with machine learning and so on. And um, we try to answer the question, what is the defect that uh, is um, making the, the force uh, 400 kilonewton on this wheel? Yeah? Is it a material fallout or is it just a flat uh, wheel? Is it a polygonization? Um, this is very important because this uh, is directly saying, do we have to react in a short term? So making a maintenance for the vehicle in a short term in the next depot? Or um, are we maybe having a little bit more time because it's just a flat spot? And flat spot, um, as I already mentioned, is, uh, is noisy, yeah? is causing stress, trouble, um, and making a lot of sound, um, but not so dangerous like a material fallout. Mm. Material fallout can cause a, a braking wheel, a uh, flat wheel is uh, probably something if you turn around again and again, it becomes <laughs> round <laughs> enough, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that that actually already sort of answers uh, one of the questions uh, somebody had at home because uh, Alicia was asking, do you use machine learning need to, to detect or assess the severity of defects? Um, the severity of defects, not, not really. Um, the severity is for us um, how... How urgent is the defect? Um, we use uh, thresholds for the severity. This means uh, we can say, for example, um, at force um, 400, it is a critical issue. Yeah? And if you measure, for example, uh, 50 kilonewton, it is not that critical, this issue. So we have not to pay this attention. What we do more with machine learning is um, we try to figure out uh, what kind of defect is causing this threshold. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an additional information um, that we try to, to add as value for the customer so that the fleet manager has an indication 
uh, not only what is raising the threshold, but also what is causing the threshold. Mm. Yeah. I think mm. an important point to make at that juncture is, is if, you, if you take a look at the history of monitoring, first of all, as, as, as Marcus says, you had just a simple alarm. And that was the state, that was the, the sum total of all of the monitoring that you could do. So you had an alarm and you stopped the train and you figured out what the problem was. The next stage is that in the last 10 years, many railways around the world have moved to condition-based maintenance. And that was taking a look at how the uh, asset has performed perhaps in the last day or week or, or month and trying to uh, make the operation of the railway more efficient by scheduling only those sets that need work uh, into the depot at the right time. And now what we're looking at is the third stage, if you like, which is predictive maintenance, where you need to understand how the asset has performed and you can extrapolate data and data patterns in the future and say, OK, you've got about three weeks left on that before you need to take, take action or, or the infrastructure manager is going to stop your train and you're going to end up with a bigger headache. And what we have realized, and I think what Niels is also going to discuss in the next uh, segment, is you need the customer at the table more the further you, you go down that, that evolution. So the alarm, you can just say, OK, what, what threshold do you want us to stop the train? Or what threshold would you like us to uh, advise your signalers that they should take action and stop the train? And that's quite simple. That's a sh reasonably short conversation. If you come to condition-based maintenance, you need to understand what the ecosystem is of the data, like you know, the, the train operating companies on HS1 are not allowed to set the last threshold of the fleet, con uh, fleet condition monitoring app above the last or uh, last uh, um, uh, alarm threshold of network rail because that would serve no purpose. Network rail would stop the train before Eurostar got the final alert. So you need the customers all around the table to understand what's going on there. Yeah, and, and someone then was actually this, asking like who typically decides about about those thresholds? The customer, absolutely. Yeah. Really? There's there's no doubt. I mean, you know, I'm. Um, we did a we did a few presentations recently, and uh, I think uh, uh, my my colleague uh, Stefan was down in Australia, where he was told by a customer like we know about our railways. Okay, we know more than you do, and, and that's absolutely correct. You know, if I I could sell you a car, but I'm not going to tell you how to drive it. Okay, I'm just going to make sure that it performs in the way that you would expect it to. Okay, but in the realm of data collection and data anal analysis what we need to do is to work with the customer to understand how they want to use the system, where the value is to them, and what they were going to look for in the future as well. So that's, yeah. that's definitely where we stand on that. Um, and another question was, um, is, a is a diagnosis um, online or offline? And I think that relates to the diagnosis of, well, this is a train... Uh, yeah, maybe you can answer it. I suppose it's online because the data is coming in continuously. Well, I'll, I'll let Marcus answer the technical side of that. But from, from the operational side, I would say that the diagnosis happens both online and in the depot, okay? Because you can have a learning algorithm, but in order to support the decisions, what you need is um, evidence. So you still need somebody to go into the depot and go like, were we right? Okay, somebody yeah, needs sure. to take yeah. an action and go like, okay, let's prove that. Let's get a let's get an understanding. But what we have done in CMS so far is learn from what we've been doing over the last twenty five years and suggest to the customer that we believe this is the type of defect that they have on that wheel or that axle, and project to the customer. We believe that you've got that kind of defect growing in that wheel set, and we should suggest that you take action. Um, and, and that is based on the relationships that we've had with our customers and what they've told us and what we've learned, and, and, and we've, we've programmed that into our software. Yeah. And another question was, um, does that diagnose only apply to a vehicle, or can it also say something about the status of the, of the tracks? Ah, that's a great question. So... Um, Yes, again, for some of our customers, especially with Network Rail, what we've managed to do is to suggest to the customer that there is, uh, for example, uh, the requirement of a little bit of track work to take place at that monitoring location. Um, because what we're able to detect through the wheel defect detection system is, is movement of the rail to a certain degree. It's uh, you know, um, something that the customers uh, understand.
understood from the data. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's possible that you, once you've started to analyze the data, I'm quite confident about this actually, is that you begin to see trends in other areas that you perhaps did not first expect, or you didn't obtain the system to provide you with this kind of intelligence, but you just pick it up along the way because you start looking at the data. Yeah. Um, yeah, and in the meantime, uh, we actually also have a question for the audience that we would like uh, to ask you a question and then we can discuss it here. Um, namely, what um, is currently stopping you from doing more with your data if it, of course, applies to you? Um, so you should be seeing uh, this question in the, in the webinar program. Uh, and the options are uh, data access time Resources or resources or expertise. Um, so it will take a while before all, all of your answers come in. So uh, in the meantime, um, we would like to uh, yeah to get back to uh, to Niels Klovenberg of DSB. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, you are uh, a fleet manager uh, at DSB. And, um, can you ex explain a little bit about what is your what your job and your responsibilities? Well, I'm a, I'm a fleet manager for for our 44 EMUs. Uh, I'm a self-proclaimed product champion for DSB's use of sensor data, including all the wayside detection data systems that are sitting around uh, Denmark and actually also in Sweden, even though they're not made by Crystal Clean. Yeah, and um, so and so you're um, yeah in charge of. Uh that the trains are always in the in the in the right condition to to keep running. Well, the fleet manager in DSB is uh, sort of uh, the technical owner of the train. Uh, thus, uh, we're in charge of seeing that the train will work in six months' time and um, uh, develop any any sort of uh, changes to the train or the train systems and so forth. Uh, we're in charge of the maintenance programs. Uh, also uh, enhancing those and trying to optimize them. So it's a little bit of a, uh, what do you call it, a, an octopus part of job, but all technically related. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, and before uh, we continue and now with, uh, with the Q&A with you, um, we could go back to the question we uh, I just asked um, to the viewers, namely what is stopping uh, people from doing more with the data. Uh, and it seems the number one answer is actually a tie, so we can uh, discuss both of them, because the mo most chosen option uh, is time and resources. Um, so it, it, do, you, it, do you recognize that? Yeah, uh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, that goes back to the, the, the um, analogy that I was using about the, you know, creating a big data lake and not having the time to take a look at the data that has been collected. Um, the, it is, um, yeah. How can I say that time is a time is a precious resource, but at the same time, you you have all of that intelligence sitting inside of a server somewhere, and it's getting added to with every train passage. Um, and uh, it, I believe that there will be um, inside these data lakes um, um, significant amounts of insight to be gained on how that railway and how that um, um, uh, asset, how that uh, train is performing. So what we in Verstalpina have seen and what we are um, in the process of, of, of sort of, uh, you know, rolling out to customers is, is the service of consultancy. And uh, what we aim to do is to assist customers who don't perhaps have the time or the resource um, to analyze the data uh, take a look at uh, how the assets are performing, see if we can you know, see any patterns that are uh, growing, uh, see if we've seen this sort of thing before, um, and uh, work with the customer or, uh, to, to suggest ways that they can make changes to their operation or their processes um, that, would, um, that would provide them with um, the cost advantages, time advantages uh, in the future. Yeah. And, um, and Niels, how would you say, uh, yeah, you of course are then using the, the, the CMS system of uh, Vesopina. Is it also the case that you, you think there could be still a lot done more with, with the data that's collected? 
<coughs> certainly, but uh, um, it was any kind of data that that we get, we as we start looking into them, we actually gain further insights into many more dis, uh, disciplines that are not really linked to it, but that we see derived uh, errors that we can actually get out of the data. So I would not say every day, but every six months, we've learned new things that we get, new insights that we can get from the data that we get from, from these systems and, and other sensor systems. Yeah. And, um, and how long have you worked with the, the CMS system now at DSB? Well, we've, we've systematically entered into operations since 2016. We first did a pilot with First Alpine and Banda Denmark in 2012. Uh, based on that, Banda Denmark then decided to roll out weight and motion systems all over Denmark, or in Danish terms, all over Denmark, not in DSB terms. But uh, so since 2016, we've been using it systematically. And since then, we've reduced the amount of dynamic forces that we put into the track and thus into our bogies by 90 to 95%, which is a huge win-win. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, what are you, can you give some examples of what you are uh, using this data for? Well, we use it, we use it to, to recognize uh, wheel defects uh, much, much earlier. Uh, the, the number 400 kilonewtons was mentioned earlier. The lowest uh, warning level that we have set up right now is 38. Wow. We're looking at we're looking at uh, basically a, a factor of 10 down from what the infrastructure managers are looking at, and we're using that to to pinpoint we have okay we have a spalling or a material fallout is the sort of a Danish term, but spalling. Uh, wheel defects coming out, we have uh, recognized brake flats and we're able to take out those areas uh, weeks before we were able to beforehand. So uh, that's what the weight and motion, then we use the hot box detection obviously to, to take out uh, bearings that are likely to fail uh, within a certain time. This of course is a very rare instance, but uh, again, we don't want trains to stop and take their passengers out of the trains and put the trains on roller skates to get them home. We want to to fix the error before it becomes apparent to the passenger that something is even happening. Um, yeah, what else? Well, uh, by reducing wheel defects, we reduce noise. We, you reduce mechanical stress. Yeah. Yeah, there's some good, some good examples already. And, and what, um, what would you say are the main benefits and to combine, yeah, Combine it all in this uh, in this system and having used it uh, after you know, quite some years already. Well, <clears throat> the main the main benefit is that our trains are exposed to less physical uh, damage. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, a, wheel, a typical uh, wheel wheel flat will in amplitude and in um, in frequency pretty much match uh, a pneumatic hammer. So if I have a, a brake flat of 30 millimeters, whoop, uh, I will have a pneumatic jack uh, hammer uh, knocking into the into the rails every every time the, the train runs over the rail. And same thing will happen, it will go, that same force will happen into my, or will expose my, my unsuspended mass to the same sort of forces and not doing so will make my mechanical po components last longer. It will make my neighbors happier because they don't have somebody <laughs> standing outside their window with a jackhammer every five minutes. So it's um, um, yeah. just act on act on data early is, is really to, to our benefit. Yeah, and were there uh, for DSB some challenging when you were yeah implementing uh, this data or get to use the new ways of uh, of analyzing them? Well, the main problem we had, or it's not a problem, but challenge we had was actually to get uh, the people who use the system or or get the data made available to buy into the the validity of the data uh, that they actually can trust the data. We're at the point now that we have 83 active users and that's ranging from fleet managers, fleet engineers, uh, production supervisors, production planners, data analyzers and lathe operators. 
but all these people have to believe in the data. And we're there that we actually take trains out of operation based on sensor data uh, without putting them through the workshops to confirm the, the, that the error is there. We trust the data so much. How long did it take for you to get from system implementation to the point that you're, that you're describing now? Uh, generally, generally speaking, uh, about 18 months. And then uh, it's progressed on the on that. Uh, I, I I get something like ten or fifteen extra users that want to come onto the system every every six months or so, okay. because they can use the data or they want to get the 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 warning or they can use the data to actually okay we can let this train run for another four days before we need to take it out or whatever. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of people that that find find the, the ability to see what's going on, they they find that uh, useful to their, their job. Did you find also other aspects in data analysis in terms of was there a uh, seasonal change um, that you saw uh, in, the, the, in, in the data? So was there a particular period of the year that, that um, made um, uh, contributed to, to, to more failures or, or, or more defects? <laughs> Yeah, well, we we live in a wettish climate in Denmark. I'm sure it's the same thing as in most of Northern Europe, in, in Austria or further south. It's sort of a more on and off issue. But but we see generally when we come into fall and the leaves come off the trees, the the rails get slippery and we get a lot of brake defects. And and we can actually by looking at the data or or the pickup in in the amount of defects, we are able to, to see, okay, now, well, you, know, you can look out the window, but we can look at the data and see that <laughs> the leaves are coming off the trees. Right. And where. And where, okay. Yeah, no, that's good. also uh, indeed a great use. Uh, and and um, yeah, now you've already used this system for uh, for a while. Is there any um, yeah, next things you are, you're going to uh, do with it? I heard uh, earlier you were developing uh, some yeah, to implement more machine learning and to get more insights? Well, what we want to do is we want to automate the, uh, the system uh, more, more as, uh, as, as most we can. And to do that, we need to get a higher confidence into, into actually classifying errors, whether it's a, if it's a wheel flat or if it's a material fallout spalling or whatever we're having. Uh, how fast is it growing and so forth. And we're using machine learning with Bristol Peen to, to get that on board, thus uh, taking, uh, taking uh, the skilled expertise of reading the data out of the equation, which would actually make the, the warnings that we're sending off to the dispatchers or, or our own dispatchers, that they're more reliable so they know how to react to them. Yeah, um, let me take a look at uh, some of the, the questions uh, at home. Feel free to uh, for sale some time to, uh, to answer some more. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, yeah, this question for, uh, for one of uh, you two in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Does Facebook take care of data ingestion like building the d data lakes um, you just mentioned, or is that up to the customer? That's a good question. Um, I think... Uh, if I look at the customers that are currently um, um, sort of the predominant CMS users, I would say that we can we can facilitate um, the storage of the data. One of uh, one of our customers, one of my personal customers, is uh, now investing in in, in sort of uh, uh, servers to be installed on um, their own premises, and they're going to create their archive based on that, and the CMS can support that. Um, they've also got uh, data management software on those servers. And we can point them in the right direction as to how best that can be managed. Um, I wouldn't say that right now um, Versalpina is a cloud provider. Uh, I don't think that's really our specialty. Although, again, we can point people in the right direction. But the Phoenix CMS can be used to um, you know, um, and help to analyze the data and uh, come up with new insights. Yeah, and then uh, as a follow-up question, um, and then you code on top of the data of the customer. Yeah, uh, you mean sort of work with data that comes from other types of system and, and, and put yeah, that out? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so um, one of the um, 
most flexible aspects of the of the CMS program, if you like, is that we've got a um, standardized um, interface protocol that we uh, we use based on the webhooks principle. And that allows data to be uh, ingested into the Phoenix CMS from um, third party systems that the customer may already have uh, in their monitoring estate. Uh, and that can then be represented, that data can be represented uh, to customers through the, through the application. Um, and then similarly, we use the same concept to put the data, take the data from CMS and pipe that into a third party system that the customer might be using for depot management, for example. Uh, it could be IBM's Maximo or uh, a SCADA system of one of the big signaling contractors. Yes. Yeah. So again, we're not against, we don't want to hoard the data. We, you know, we're, not, um, we're, not, we're not trying to make it difficult for customers to have one system or the other. We're looking to get around the table with the customers and participate with their operations and, um, uh, and, and you know, make, the, make the data front and center of their decision making. Yeah, and maybe that could also be a, a question for Niels. Like, how have you implemented it with the the systems? Maybe the DSB was already using, or how is it uh, combining? We we haven't. We don't have systems. The systems we're getting data from are all owned by Banda Denmark, Deutsche Fikwerket in Sweden, uh, Storbelt. Uh, we don't have systems ourselves. We're using uh, uh, infrastructure managers' systems mm -hmm. as data providers. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And then maybe they, that's then a question that indeed for, for them who have, have the systems. Um, so for you, it was really no, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter like where it's it's stored or uh, which system are connected. You're just, uh, yeah, using the... Well, you need you need to have uh, the infrastructure manager need to be willing to, to share the, the data with the operators. But uh, but it's uh, as I've said before, it's a huge win-win. So sharing this data is to to the benefit of the railroad, not just mm -hmm. operators or infrastructure managers. Yeah, indeed. So it can uh, not damage the tracks, and it's good uh, if the trains are not damaged, of course. Yeah, true, and that also is a is is what what Niels is describing there is 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 one of the reasons why. Um, the HS1 case study is also a good example of data sharing amongst the infrastructure owner and the train operating companies. You know, the train operating companies don't want their train stopped in the middle of nowhere, so they get the information ahead of time. And the infrastructure owner is really using the data as a last line of defense. Um, and if that has to, if, if the train has to be stopped, then it's stopped. And that is, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is the absolute way that that railway uh, likes to handle its data. But that I, I see is very much a um, uh, sort of a, a trend leading environment for the data because not every railway in the world um, wants to wants to share its data so flexibly, liberally, that sort of thing. You know, there's still that, uh, there's still a, a, um, an aspect of, oh, I bought that system, that data belongs to me. Um, but what we try to promote uh, when we talk about the software is is what is the data ecosystem going to be? What is the data storyline going to be? How are you going to use it? How are you going to share it? And, and we have to, as a supplier, react to how the customer wants to play the game, really, and how to use and utilize and develop the data. Yeah, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's, an, it's an ongoing conversation. It is, again, why Verstalpine, Verstalpine are engaging in the consultancy um, service uh, uh, model because we feel that there's a valuable conversation to have to educate customers on how to get the best out of their data. Yeah, indeed. Um, another question uh, is more related to yeah, the, the business model. Yeah. Uh, is it really, the, because also yeah, you, of course, have these monitoring checkpoints mm. into the hardware and then the CMS. Is it also um, like a data as a service or is it a combination? Well, I, I don't want to give too much away. I mean, all things are on the table, um, and it depends very much on how the how the customer would like to um, um, obtain the data. So, one of the things that I'll be talking about when I do the presentation at the Intelligent Rail Summit in November is actually, as a salesperson, it should be uh, it it could be a, a, a concept for the conversation that you start at the end. So, everybody knows. In railways, Niels, especially, how, how, does, how does an HPD work? How does the wheel defect detection system work? How does the PBS system work? Those concepts are quite ready, readily understood. But how does the customer want to use the data? And, um, you know, 
to, to look at how is the data going to be implemented inside an organization? Because people are very reluctant to change, as Neil just mentioned. Um, but the data needs to be um, in, presented in such a way that it's readily understood. And we have to understand how to present it. Um, and the data itself is the most valuable part of that service provision, so to speak. So it could be in the future that, um, and, and I think Niels is sort of some way there already, it could be that the people who are taking action on the data don't own the monitoring system. It could be that way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very much. Um, yeah, maybe one, uh, one last question, because uh, it's uh, <laughs> almost time already. Um, yeah, I think Niels, you also said before that since using uh, it, there's been, well, I don't remember, Exactly the percentage, but so and so the down, uh, yeah, reduction in uh, yeah hotbox or uh, flat wheels, something like that. Dynamic, dynamic force. Yeah, dynamic force. <laughs> uh, is there also an, an estimate of uh, of a financial saving uh, of using a system? Nope, uh, because uh, we don't really know what how <laughs> what to mention or what to measure. Uh, you could you could look at something like uh, usage of, of wheel, but there's so many uh, so many factors involved that uh, it's not something we've even tried to to take out. Uh, if you want to get a number like that, I'm, I would suspect that uh, it would be better to talk to uh, to the infrastructure owners and have them look at how often they need to tamp their tracks. Because I, I believe that uh, if the operators put less dynamic force into the track, then tamping should be less frequent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting statistic, which is I, I would imagine hidden in the data yeah. of the customers. Yeah, uh, but your friends with Plus and Toyo will hate you. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah. But the the data will exist somewhere, and even if it's no 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 difference at all, it will exist somewhere to say that since the implementation of nationwide wild systems has the purchase of new rail gone down, has the lifetime of the track that's been installed been extended, has the number of times that that section of track needed tamping or grinding, uh, you know, changed. So again, I think that there is scope for new insights to be given and to be provided from data that's that's some simple systems that have been installed yeah, and that's years ago. probably also difficult to say because there might be also other influences on why yeah and maybe there's been less track new with yeah some, some other uh, yeah outside uh, yeah, uh, yeah things it's, and it's of course also different for the infrastructure side is it there is an, an the advantage of less damage but also for uh, for the exactly. operators yeah the customer is the expert the yeah. customer is the expert. We just help them see um, where the uh, where the opportunity in the data may lie. Yes. Well, thank you. I think that brings uh, us already at the, at the end of this webinar. Um, uh, I would like to uh, thank, of course, everybody uh, for watching and also uh, Niels for joining us online, and uh, Richard and Marcus also. Thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, like uh, you also mentioned a couple times, we will also continue this. Uh, discussion and this uh, topic at the Intelligent Real Summit. It takes place uh, 16 and 17 November in Konstanz, Germany, uh, close to Switzerland, where, where there will also be a, a site visit with uh, SBB. Um, so uh, we hope to see you there and where you also will be uh, there. So uh, thank you for watching and have a good day.
Fußball Biene. One step ahead.